Arsenal scored six goals and win, and in doing so, achieved something no other top six team was able to achieve this week. Win a second round League Cup tie. This is the Arsenal Vision Postmatch Podcast. My name is Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. City didn't do it. United didn't do it. Chelsea didn't do it. Liverpool didn't do it. Spurs didn't do it. None of them won a second round League Cup tie, but we did, and dare I say we did it emphatically. We beat some kids up, but in the good way. Um, I, I mean, there are bad ways that you could say that, but this is the good way. It reminds me of when when you'd play young boys in the Champions League or something, and there was like no headline you could write that didn't sound terrible. There's no good way to say you beat up some kids, but we did beat up some kids, and it was a hell of a lot of fun. And I think there will be a temptation always to dismiss performances against that level of opposition. It was basically the U23s from West Bromwich Albion, but why do that? Like, why do that? Wait, this was fun. If you can't have fun when Arsenal scores six goals and win, dare I say it, you, you may need to engage in another activity. This was a hell of a lot of fun. I think it was a, a jolt to the system that was needed. I think, much like, unfortunately, the hysteria at losing to the European champions with first-team players missing can be too hysterical. The euphoria at winning a game like this can also lead to some bad analysis. So hopefully we'll be able to avoid those pitfalls while still enjoying what was a very enjoyable game. Now this, you may notice, is episode 499 of the Arsenal Vision Postmatch Podcast. That means the next one on Monday is episode 500. Uh, it is a special milestone, and we are going to mark that milestone by kicking off our Arsenal Foundation fundraiser. So starting on Monday, you'll have the ability to give to that. We are going to give quite generously to that ourselves in the hope of uh, jump-starting what will be a very successful campaign for that. And, uh, you know, hopefully doesn't obscure the analysis of, of the incoming 6 no win over City as well. So let me introduce the panel, uh, because that is how we kick off the show. And Tim is here. You can find him on Twitter at Stubberto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. Let me ask you something, Tim. Were you in your cups last night as much as Clive was in his cups? M more so, more so. Really? I, I listened to, yeah, I listened to the instant reaction and yeah, he was far more coherent than I'd have been. I, I had a good seven pints before that game started and then <laughs> another three cans of Guinness. You've still got it, Tim. You've still got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No preseason for me. I've, I've dived straight back in. I'm <laughs> two footed. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. If you missed that instant reaction, you've ever thought of signing up for Patreon, Drunk Clive is worth it. I'm just going to say Drunk Clive is worth it. And Sober Clive is here. Well, I presume Sober Clive is here. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PAC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Uh, a little bit tired today. Just a little bit. The good news is, unlike... So, Tim, you hear the huskiness in his voice. You always have it, so no one can tell the damn difference. Uh, pause on Twitter. Pause in my pants. Hello, pause. Woohoo! How are you, Pause? You sober and happy? I'm sober again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a six-year-old and, an, and a 19-month-old, and so, like, my life is maybe I can sneak in a cheeky old-fashioned at, like, 9.45 before going to bed at 10. Uh, so my ability to get drunk is extremely limited, but I, I work at it nonetheless. And I hope wherever you are, you you enjoyed a celebratory drink of whatever you drink, even if it's apple juice, uh, because it was, it was a fun night. Tim, I guess the only place to start is with your adventures. It sounds like they were quite adventurous. We could hear you the whole game. It was a delight. I mean, football being back doesn't really feel like it's back until the away Arsenal fans are absolutely ripping the piss out of a home side, getting their, their necks broken, which was delightful, uh, especially given that the players at times seemed like they were trying to break bones of Arsenal players, which is unfortunate. So uh, how was your excursion? Yeah, really, really good. Really, really enjoyed it. I've, I've actually, I've really enjoyed all the games so far. Um, I have enjoyed Brentford. I have enjoyed Chelsea. And Clive and I were having a, a chat about this off mic, actually. And and th there are a couple of things that it's kind of made me um, not reconsider, but recalibrate. Um, first of all, I think, you know, quite understandably for a whole year, just lost that whole visceral side of, of being at a game. And, and, and what what's really interesting again, because there's all this like Arsenal oh, the worst fans in the world and all this, and and actually like they, we, everyone was in really really good voice last night. And Aaron Ramsdale got an amazing reception and got his name sung constantly. And the new song about Smith Rowe and Saka. And um, I, I was having a, a chat with a, a friend of mine, Ricky, um, the other day about you know what what like what is it that's going to make us happy as Arsenal fans over the next couple of years? Because basically we can't win the league we probably can't even get in the top four. And it's kind of difficult to get excited about fifth or sixth. Um, but his point of view was, you know, well, actually, we've got like a former club captain coaching a team full of young players now. And that's that's one of the things that if you can't win the league or do the things that really make you happy, that's kind of the thing that would 
a lot of fans would say figures on their kind of Maslow triangle of needs as fans. And so his his point that really made me think was, actually, if we can't get behind that, like what can we get behind? And that's not to say Arteta's brilliant and all these new players we're buying are excellent. They might all be rubbish. Arteta might be rubbish or whatever. But um, what's been really nice, not just last night, but over the first few games, is the feeling that everyone really wants to be behind um, this this team and and I don't know if that means this project I don't know if it if it really matters they they're behind the team and what would be really interesting for me is whether like to what extent this is just the fact that maybe having been out of the stadium for a year people like me lost contact with that more visceral side of being a fan or to what extent I I I imagine it's a bit of both and but also to what extent there's a bit of novelty factor going on and I really just, people are so happy to be back. And, uh, and I, I'm really, I really want to mark with interest what it's like in about November, December, when some of that novelty factor has disappeared and whether there's still this kind of, I, I hesitate to say the word joyousness, but there is a, a sense of joyousness. And I really hope that that translates just into, you know, certainly inside the stadium, like just fans getting behind the team and then like doing all your moaning on Twitter and all of that, because that's kind of what it's for. And actually that's, I think that's actually probably quite a healthy divergence in many ways. If you do your moaning online, (laughs) but in the stadium kind of just get behind everyone. And I do think over the last years of the Wenger reign, those two things did start to bleed into one another. And I hope that this, this becomes like more of a clean separation now. So, <clears throat> all in all, I mean, first of all, I, I got to hand it to you. Super hungover, not feeling your best, still pulls out Maslow's triangle of needs. I mean, you've always <laughs> you've always got something erudite uh, on file if you need it. But so, I mean, a, a special occasion in terms of just the joy of it. Look, I think I've said this before. I can live with being a sixth place team. I, I can't really live with being an eighth place team under any circumstances, probably. But like, if there's a night like this every few weeks. It makes it all worthwhile. I mean, even when we were getting hammered by Chelsea and Liverpool under Arsene Wenger, we would absolutely smack the shit out of some minnows from time to time, and that was fun. And, you know, I think I said going into this season, not having Europa League group stage will be hard because that brought some of the good feeling back. And for me, this brought a little good feeling back. I know it doesn't mean anything, but it brought some good feeling back, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't have to mean anything beyond... That was fun, and yeah, it's you know, football. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't exactly. have to mean anything. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Like I, you know, I think the phrase used on the instant reaction is like, uh, like taking something out of a box, enjoying it, closing the box, and putting it away again. That's mm-hmm. that's fine if it's it's kind of disposable. And I, I guess, I mean, on on a not on a more serious note, but on a more like I guess on the pitch note, I'm glad Arteta took this seriously. I think there was no reason not to. I think everyone knew we needed that. We needed to exercise ourselves. Uh, all of us had to like purge ourselves a little bit, um, but also with no Europe, there's no reason not to take the Carabao Cup seriously. And the Carabao Cup, you know, there, there aren't as many games as the Europa League group stage, but that could become the fun thing um, this season. Um, it really could. And and look, it's one of only two trophies we can actually win, so we absolutely should go for it. I think we approached it absolutely as we should have, and great fun was had all round. Yeah, and I'm we sure get Wimbledon. The players, in the, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure the players loved it as well. Yeah, and we get Wimbledon in the next round. So, I mean, it, it's another opportunity to have a fun night out before this gets real serious and maybe go beat up another side. I mean, you don't want to take that for granted. Uh, Clive, we did play 11, a, a West Brom team with 11 changes. And this really was like a U23 side. And as they started to pick up some injuries, ironically, trying to injure us, it became more like a U19 side or something. So, um, so you're saying this side was very, very fresh. <laughs> yes, fresh, energetic. Uh, but the funny thing is I had I had sort of a gallows humor moment where I was like, this must be what it's like playing against Arsenal. Because at one point they had like a broken high line and no ball pressure. And every single pass every Arsenal player made into the West Brom half had three Arsenal forwards running onto it behind their defense. It was just a ton of fun. But, you know, I wonder, since you can't draw too much from the tactics or the performances out of this, what you think it means... For a player, for example, like Saka, who came in, had a bit of a rough ride against Chelsea, has had a rough summer to come in and just enjoy his football, have fun, get some end product, be the best player on the pitch, and get that feeling again. I mean, I hate to do this. I I hate to do this. I'm going to do it. There's an episode of Ted Lasso. <laughs> just came out. One of the players for the team that's featured in the show 
is in, is in a, a low point emotionally and he's struggling on the pitch. And the old player, Roy Kent, takes him to like a five-a-side game you know, in the in the city where it's just some like local kids playing. He's like, go play in this game. He's like, why? I'm a professional. He's like, just so you can remember that this is fun. This is supposed to be fun and that you're really good. And he gets his mojo back and then he goes and like dominates in the regular game. Like, okay, it's Ted Lasso. But Ted Lasso must be right, Clive, right? Like there, there is a benefit to Saka going out there, to Aubameyang going out there, enjoying their football, scoring goals, having it all their way. It doesn't mean you go beat City, but do you think that that benefit can have a knock-on effect even if it is against West Brom's kids? Well, how do you feel today? Do you feel better or worse? Do I sound okay? I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I feel damn sight better than you guys. I tell you, waking up this morning was good. Well, I don't care who is against. I didn't look at their team. I don't care about them. I just care about the fact we've been, we, we are the narrative at the moment and the, and the press and the media are just stacking up and waiting for this game at the weekend. To and be fair, Clive, I think Cristiano Ronaldo going to Man City is going to knock us off the back pages for a Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe. And then Bappe going to Real Madrid, is that right? So, um, so yeah, I, I just think we're, we're, we're being lined up. We're being lined up for the zero points, you know, from three games. So, yeah, it did feel really good. And I'm, I'm absolutely fine with it. And I had, I did have a little rewatch today, not the whole game, just <laughs> wanted to get something in my memory for the podcast. <laughs> and... Uh, and I was just looking at how we moved in, in the central areas as we progressed the ball. And I've got to tell you, man, that kid, Saka, knows where to go. He is so intelligent. He doesn't just roll. He rolls inside. He rolls off the front line. And every time he's in space and he's demanding the ball, he's starting to grow up and demand of his teammates. I want it quick. I want it now. And when he gets it, he just got such awareness of where he is, what to do, when to combine, when to go and join, when to follow. I mean, God, dear, he's only nineteen. I mean, bloody, how can you be so wise at nineteen? I, I honestly, I just don't get it. Um, and I, 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 th- I think he's. Um, we said about it last night, and I know I said it a hundred times. He keeps surprising me how good he is and how effective he is. You know, and I just hope he doesn't outgrow us. That's that's my worry. You know. Um, hey, 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 <laughs> hey, hey! Taps, whiskers, mug. Worrying is my business. You stay out of it. Yeah, yeah. I just hope he doesn't outgrow us. I'm, I remember um, being at Arsenal when Seth Fabregas was about to leave, and I was looking at him, and and he's watching training, and I was looking, and I'm thinking, "You're too big for us now. You're going to go." I remember that feeling, I think, and he did go, literally about two months later. I don't want that to feel, I don't think it's going to happen with this kid, not yet, but trust me, we got something special. I know I've said it before, but we really Stesk do. Stesk went back to his academy club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, when he went, he went, we were 25 mil, see you later. But yeah, I, I just enjoyed watching this guy play football. I'm learning the game through him. And I, that shouldn't be the case. I'm nearly 100. He's only 19. I should not be learning the game through him. And he is just mm. brilliant how he receives it, how he gets it, how he knows when to, to leave his man. I, I'm I'm stunned by how good he could actually be. You know, two weeks ago, I'm thinking, don't get selected for England. Sit there, be at Arsenal, do your work, get ready for Norwich. After last night, I think you've got to go to England. <laughs> and he has been selected today. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a real huge fan, but I'm a really huge fan. If it makes you look uh, feel better, you don't look a day over 95. So, Thank you. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the Saka thing is great because he is a player that we need and we're going to rely on. And I think the other player, obviously, is Aubameyang, Paul. This is, this is the interesting thing, right? Trying to really get your head around the fact that the level of opposition was comically bad and still come up with analysis that is relevant and doesn't make you look bad, right? Like, I mean, hysterical overreaction to Chelsea with tons of starters missing and them having one of the best strikers in the world joining them doesn't make any sense. But the opposite doesn't make any sense either. So you have to find your balance. But, I mean, this is going to unfortunately wind up probably being a big soft factor podcast. If you don't like that thing, I'm going to just warn you because... Really, the thing you're going to say these players can take away from this game is the, our, our fabled confidence. Now, that confidence can get destroyed very quickly playing the reigning Premier League champions at the weekend, especially if they add Cristiano Ronaldo and his visas processed in 42 minutes as he's driving to the game. But 
I do think that the Obamiang situation is an important one because it's not just his comfort level. It's also fans starting to turn on him. You know, is he going to go to City? Is there a problem behind the scenes? And then you see him go out there and just genuinely give his all against a changed West Brom side in the League Cup and have that hunger to score goals. And the first goal... I almost think it's the most important one. Not because it's the hardest one to tap in, but because it's that typical Aubameyang. He's first to respond to the to the shot. He gets around the defender who's between him and the goal with an explosive first step, puts him on his back so he can't get between him, and he makes a tap in for himself with the exact kind of movement and an explosive first step that we associate with Aubameyang. Yeah, the curled in shot when it's already 4-0 or whatever, that, that's all fun and games. I, I like this Aubameyang performance, and I... I even though every every one of my boring, uh, annoying fibers in my body tells me not to read too much into it, I can't help it. I think it. I think it matters for this player in this moment in his career at Arsenal. Do you? Are you with me? Are we going to dive into this pool of soft factors together? We are. Look, I think the opposition may not have been up to much, but this was a very important game. Uh, or looking back, we may see it as such. We had a very truncated, messed up preseason with all, you know, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Uh, a cancelled tour um, because of COVID, um, uh, you know, screwed up games, surprise attack on on uh, to play Rangers and who was it, Hibs or whatever, where... Uh, suddenly there's, oh, the game's going to be shown in one hour's time. That's because, like, they're making it up. Like, it's not ideal. Then you get Brentford and we're missing our attack. And then you're then you're onto Chelsea and we're not much better off. Um, and we got the Brentford game behind us uh, as a cloud. And here we are finally. To me, this feels like not a preseason game, but the game that, that got us to where preseason was supposed to get us. Um, and it's psychologically very important. I think the performances. Um, uh, what I liked about this game was that tactically there are some very interesting parts to it. N- maybe not surprising, but I think interesting. So Odegaard's in the mix. Um, as I said on the instant reaction, we kind of have this W formation that we've seen before, but Nuno Tavares high and wide like um uh, Tierney normally is Pepe high and wide on the right, and you have Odegaard and Saka uh, almost symmetric uh, in terms of their positioning with Alba at the point. And basically, it's all about creating opportunities for Alba, and he gets three goals in this. I actually thought the third goal was the most important for a different reason, because I actually think, although it's just a standard Thierry Henry, Aubameyang from the left finish, I mean, when you look at it, you still wonder, how does he do that? The quality of the finish, the kind of the short back lift. I mean, many will try, not many will will pull off the the skill, the beauty of that shot. And he's going to, like, with the other goals, he can say, he'll always have in the back of his mind, well, it was a bit of a tap in or I was in the right spot and that's all good. At this one, he'll think, oh, yeah, oh, I felt that. So, like... Opposition aside, it was a beautiful finish, um, a striker's goal, the beauty of it. Um, So he'll come out of this feeling pretty good. But tactically, this was a game that allowed us to remind ourselves what it is we're trying to do against the the better teams and the middle teams in the league. This allowed us... Uh, with Odegaard in there conducting the attack, with with Saka falling into uh, a midfield spot, nice rotations. It allowed us to play our game in the attacking end, which we haven't had haven't had much of a chance to so far. So uh, you can't read a yeah. huge amount into it, but tactically very interesting. And then the the other tactical point that I think was important was Ramsdale. Uh, playing out from the back on every ball, kickouts, whatever it was, no matter how much pressure. Now, again, why not, right? What was the the real risk, the real jeopardy? Even if they score a goal, we always thought we'd score a few back. But like an absolute commitment to uh, higher wire playing out from the back, which may be just Ramsdale showing off that he's up to it. But mm. uh, I thought those were two interesting factors. Yeah, being able to blood your new keeper, who's going to be nervous stepping up that level and have him play in a comfortable game where he gets to make a few good saves. Admittedly, the ball hit pretty much right at him and gets to practice his distribution a bit. 
with low stakes. I think that's really good. Do I think that he's now the number one? No, I mean, come on. Like, let's not forget, Bern Leno single-handedly kept us from catching a hiding against Chelsea. But like, yeah, I, I think it's a good start and I think it's exactly what you needed. There's a couple little odds and ends from this, Tim, that I, I think are interesting in terms of what happens going forward. One of them is the first 15 minutes of this game felt very different. Let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I like to read back my tweets during the game because they remind me of what I was experiencing experiencing in the moment. And that first 15 minutes looked like a team that was pretty bereft of confidence. There were a lot of sloppy passes at the back, a lot of just dumb giveaways in the defensive third. I'm wondering if as great as it is to see the attacking players get, get off to a fly, you know, a, a flying start finally. Um, do you have any sort of nervousness about some of the discomfort we experienced at the back early? I mean, Rob Holding is a guy who's going to be playing for a bit here. And he, you know, he looked really, really shaky against pretty weak opposition. Uh, I thought that Kolasinac did too, but that's an irrelevance. Tavares, again, extremely raw, but looks like Tierney's available at the weekend. And Chambers is Chambers. Like, we know the right-back situation. So it's really Holding that maybe we we could zero in on here because... He is going to play. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's that White is going to be back at the weekend, and we, you know, we don't know when Gabriel is going to be back exactly. So, was there any cause for concern for you there, especially in that opening fifteen or twenty minutes when there was just a lot of sloppiness and and sort of tissue paper softness at the back? Yeah, a little bit, but then again, I, I don't think it really said anything I, I didn't already know. I mean, what what we had was we had a situation where we didn't really have like a leader, you know, in that in that back four. We didn't have you know, I, I guess Ben White is is supposed to be that guy, right? And David or Ruiz Gabriel, was that I guy. Guess, and, yeah, yeah. And Kashelny was that guy. And you know, we, like Rob Holding isn't that guy, um, and he was probably asked to be on the night. Um, and it might have taken him a few minutes. I, I do think it, it's more. I didn't look upon it. I mean, I do think we we lack some quality in defence anyway. Um, certainly, without like our our starters there. Um, but I, I do think it was it was more the overall kind of picture. And the thing is, these League Cup games, I think they've always gone like this. But the weird thing is, like, I think League Cup football, particularly in the early rounds, is quite different from the Premier League because I think what happens is basically, I mean, they're kind of free-for-alls in a way. And when you look at some of the score lines down the years in some games that we've been involved in, um, you know, everyone will think of the 7-5 with Reading, but there was a 6-0 against Sheffield United and stuff like that. Like, in these League Cup games, I think the first goal just counts for so much because quite a lot of teams, once they go 1-0 down in a League Cup tie, they they don't really bother chasing it <laughs> anymore. Mm. Really, like, quite a lot of teams are only engaged to the point that it's 0-0, particularly if, they, you know, if they're the underdog and they're playing against a slightly bigger team. Um and and therefore the games kind of exist in their own ecosystem. Whereas if like had West Brom gone one 0 up last night, I think it would have been a really really difficult game. Like they would have really got their teeth into it from there. But I I kind of feel like these early round League Cup ties at nil nil they're very interesting. And then the first goal goes in and it's kind of all bets are off. I'd, I'd actually be very interested to see some data on how often comebacks happen in the early early rounds of the League Cup. I get the sense it's really not very often. Um, because, yeah, for, for reasons I stated. So I think there was an element of, you know, West Brom would have been up for it. It, it is their under-23s. They play together a lot, at least, even if they're, you know, not super quality at this point in their careers. Whereas that's an Arsenal team that doesn't, that probably, well, Kalasanach, not really mm. a centre-back um, for us. Tavares, uh, his first start for us. So, in that respect, like Ramsdale and, and playing Ramsdale. out of them. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there, there was like, there was more a sense of newness there. Like the, in the attack, there wasn't like the front four have all played together before, even though one of them technically a debutant um, in terms of being a permanent signing. But there, there, you, like there was a lot more synergy there. And like Xhaka and Elneny have played together a ton of times, whereas like Holding and Kalasanach. I can't imagine they've played centre half together since maybe Kalasanac first arrived, and we we're playing that back three. So I can forgive them a little bit of that, and I think it was clear that once we went one nil up, like everyone 
really just clicked into gear. Yeah, totally you know, agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, they didn't look too troubled after that. So I, I do think there was element of little, yeah, maybe a little bit of shakiness, a little bit lacking a kind of leader at the back, a little bit hadn't really played together before. Yeah, the other thing is, look, when you have a bunch of 20-year-olds playing, you know that first 10, 15 minutes, they can make up for their lack of quality with that just, it, like, Mighty Mouse energy of we're playing a, a big club and we're going to go have a go with them. But, like, once that sort of nervous energy and adrenaline wears off, they had nothing about them. So uh, it was always going to be a little bit of a tricky start. I think the reason my eye is on the defense a bit, we all know that this team needs to improve the attack. But I think there was this sense that Arteta had built this foundation of a competent defensive unit that then he could he could start to add an attack to. If the defense takes steps back, it becomes, <laughs> the calculus gets really tricky. I wanted to get to another point, but I, I noticed I had missed Clive's message wanting to add earlier. So Clive, if you still want to roll back to that, um, we can do that or we can move on. Sorry, I, I, I missed your little chat. No, 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 you move on. I, 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 no, you move on, move on. I've got a couple of thoughts in my mind that, that, that will come out and I'll just I, ignore your I'll question. I'll just ask a question, ignore the question. Yeah, perfect. Okay. <laughs> well, by the way, I got to laugh at, at, at Arsenal. I don't know if it's 3D chess that we were trying to like play 3D chess against West Brom's U23s or what the case is. But so the lineup comes out. And in my mind, I'm looking at it. If you want to see me having a bit of a mare on Twitter, like I look at the lineup, I'm like, oh, Tavares left back, Chambers right back, Kolasinac and holding center backs. Makes sense. But all these people are like, oh, we've got four right backs and we picked a left back at right back. I'm like, what? No, we haven't. What? But the way Arsenal had written the lineup, I could see why people thought that way. And I was like, no, guys, come on. You're overthinking this. And then the Arsenal Instagram account puts a picture on their story of Tavares walking into the ground and it says, are right back tonight. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I mean, why? And then he was left back. So I don't know if the Arsenal social media team was taking the piss or if they were That's confused. That's how too. seriously we took this game against WBA. We wanted to leak some some false, false information yeah, false. so they set up differently against us. Yeah. Oh, oh they're playing Tavares at right back and they changed their whole tactic and that's why we won 6-0. It was uh, the Arsenal social media team played a blinder. So, Clive, I don't know. I, I, that was kind of funny to me. But in watching Tavares, I think you have Schrodinger's fullback here. Um, it it kind of reminds me of Kolasinac in a way. When he gets into the attacking half and he can beat a man and twist and turn and dribble a guy and push the ball past, he looks really dangerous and interesting. When he's got to like play a five-yard pass or just keep the ball in his defensive third, it's a lot, it's a lot less um, of a comfortable situation. Obviously, look, he's, he's young, he's raw. We've, we've acquired him for his raw physical tools, and, and now those have to be honed. But I'm curious which Schrodinger's fullback you saw, the one who looks really, really dynamic and dangerous and physically toolsy, as they say in American sports, uh, in the attacking third, or the one who gives you a little bit of a, of, um, a heart attack in the, in the defensive third? Uh, yeah, I don't worry about things like that. I look at... I look at the player, I look at the space that he has to look after, and I look at how he approaches it. So he's approaching at the moment by really being quite intense and energetic, and everything's at 100 miles an hour. <clears throat> and I quite like that. He's like, okay, he's, he looks like he's come here to really impress and do well and really learn and really push himself to his maximum and his limits. And that's when you find out your frailties, right? So if you're jogging through a game, you don't find out your level. So I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, hey, you're, you're fine, mate. You're absolutely fine. Um, you've got size, you've got speed, you're front-footed. When he when he knocks a ball, he just goes. I quite like that. He's not bad in the air. Sometimes he breaks through a line and then plays. A, <laughs> he uses both feet, so sometimes his passing is not great. But I look at it and say, so what? When, once he's broken down, he can run back and catch the man. You know, and I look at the other fullback. Once you go past him, he's not catching anybody, right? So, if you're gonna be raw, be big, fast, and raw. You know, make sure you're you're quite dominant, and then you can develop those, you know, ball retention skills and technical ability as he goes. He's obviously can attack. You know, he he wants to beat his man. He wants to whip the ball in. He's a he's a coach. He's dreaming some way because he's so much to work with. You know, and so these attitude is what I'm looking at. I, I, I think he's a very, very interesting player and one to watch, see where he ends up and what he, and how we use him. I think he's going to be really useful this year. You see what happened with Tierney at the weekend. It doesn't take much for him to be off the pitch. So we need to be looking at this guy and hoping he develops. And so what's just going a little couple of little extra bits, Elliot. Watching the game. Love that. Please do. <laughs> watching the game on TV. I mean, Tim were talking earlier. Reminds me of the whole tapestry of the game. Seeing those 3,000 Arsenal fans in that corner, 
It just made it feel better and look better. And I was, I'm just starting to think, you know, I've been to a couple of games myself this year, and it, we're all online fans, but there's almost like a, a line between the online fan and the match-going fan. And some of our online behaviour as football fans, particularly to our new goalkeeper, has not been exemplary. And it's almost so like the match-going fan is saying, hold on a minute, we're not having this. We're going to show how to support the team. Right? And we all feel, we all have moans, but we're going we're gonna to make sure that people know what this club is and what our fans are and how we can support a team. And, you know, Tim, they, there was a lots of players that were very surprised on a Wednesday night, a Carling Cup second round, that that end was full. You know, and it does make a difference. It really does make I'd a difference. I'd be really interested in Clive because, like, part of Ramsdale's shtick is that he's always bonded specifically with the supporters, with the crowd, yeah. He talks about that quite a bit. And you can see he's got a, co- a conscious charm offensive. Just wondering how it played out on the evening. Because, like, w- one of, you know, he does have a little look at the crazies in his eyes. I mentioned this before, kind of like an Almunia. But Almunia always made everybody nervous around him, the crowd, the players. I think Ramsdale's really good at getting kind of, if you like, he, he brings his own crowd, or at least that's that's kind of what I'm hoping his shtick is, did. Did yeah. that come across? Well, people made their opinions on him based on what? Based on a few clips and the fact he's been relegated a couple watched, of times. Uh, even when you see a player playing, you don't watch the goalkeeper. You just yeah. don't. It was, and all he was to do is Martinez, the price, and it's like, oh, come on. Yeah. Just If you're going to crit- – uh, we critiqued uh, Pablo Marie last week, but it was based on what we felt uh, over a couple of performances that he got critiqued, and I did it with Karen Chambers – but at least let, let him get in the shirt, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? And I, I don't I don't like this. And I think a lot of Arsenal fans are saying, nah, we're not having this. We're not having this. If you do your if you do your work and you do your homework on somebody, you listen to people in the England camp and you listen to people and know about this position and know about this guy at twenty three, look at how many games he's played. Do your work. Look how many games he's played to a twenty three year old across Europe. He has got a lot of potential and he is no little flower. When we were first linked to him, I can say it now, but I spoke to James offline, and I knew that Arsenal were very, very serious about him. And one of the things they were really interested in was his courage and his personality. And if you look at some of the clips of him goalkeeping, he basically keeps goal of his face. He jumps in like Bob Wilson used to jump in, head first into one-on-ones. I mean, this guy is a serious, serious personality. I think Arsenal people are going to love him. Give a guys a chance before you start killing them. And I think the match game fan have, have decided to get back some of the morals by which we should be mm. behaving. I think they're, hold, they're holding us to a much higher standard, shall I say. You, can regard, the trans- <clears throat> you can regard the transfer as a mistake, as I do. You can regard the player as the wrong choice, as I do. And still support the ever-living shit out of him Absolutely. and find him incredibly likable, as I do. He is at Arsenal. I hope he is the best damn goalkeeper in the world. And I will say that regardless of my my thoughts on the transfer, he's so damn likable. I mean, I we've had some players where you're like, that guy's hard to like. Sam Nasri comes to mind. Um, this guy's easy to like. And that video of his mom giving him a kiss and his contract signing and I mean, he's great. He's great. He's he's a guy who clearly wants to be here. I'm excited he's here in the sense that he's a likable guy that you can root for. I think a lot of that goes away if you don't perform, obviously. Um, Manuel Almunia was an incredibly likable guy, just not when he pulled on the shirt. So I, I, I hope Ramsdale thrives. I hope he's incredible. I will root incredibly hard for him. You can have reasoned analysis backed by facts or evidence or you know good opinions that explain why you don't particularly think a, a transfer is right or signing is right, but once they pull on the shirt, you should be willing to root for them. I don't think anybody who opposes a transfer I shouldn't say don't think anybody. I don't I don't think most people then go ahead and hope the player fails. I mean, that would be the absolute height of stupidity if you do that. So I, I hope nobody listening is in that boat. I, I thought he got off to a good start. I hope he has a great career. I won't mention since we're just um talking goalkeepers and it's breaking news, Manchester City have suspended Benjamin Mendy uh indefinitely. He is uh charged with four counts of aggravated sexual assault. So very serious stuff there and uh just horrible thing. 
you obviously hope that it winds up not being the case, but if it is, you know, you, your thoughts go out to, to the victims. And I, I'm certainly curious on a football side what that will mean, but that is, that is terrible, terrible news. You hate to hear anything like that. But since we are a football podcast and that news is breaking, I figured I would give that out. The other thing that's breaking is the uh, Champions League draw, a thing that once upon a time mattered to us and hopefully will again. And it gives me the chance to say... The Summer of Soccer continues on Paramount+. Plus. Stream over 2,000 soccer matches. They write soccer here. I don't have a choice. I have to say soccer, okay? So just please cut me some slack. Stream over 2,000 soccer matches a year from around the world. That's all the heart-pounding drama from CBS Sports, including UEFA Champions League, Europa League, Italy's Serie A, Argentina's Primera División, the Brasileiro, or as Tim instructs me, Bra- Brasileirao, NWSL, Brasileirao, NWSL, the Asian Football Confederation, and the CONCACAF qualifiers featuring the stars from the U.S. and Mexican men's national teams, plus much more. It's the best of the beautiful game, with all the beautiful names like Messi, Mbappe, Ronaldo, City's Ronaldo, not Juventus's Ronaldo, Rapino, and more. Be part of the excitement as the champions are crowned and history is made. The world's game lives here on Paramount+. Plus. Visit ParamountPlus.com to start your free trial and stream every match live. Uh, they do have a lot of good football on there so uh certainly can't speak highly enough of that i watch all a lot of football there so if you're in their region geographically go ahead and and get subscribing so uh we continue i think we can start to turn our attention a little bit more towards the manchester city game And, and paul one of the things that i think we're all trying to read the tea leaves about is uh the manager's post match reactions and his comments he's not giving a lot away but he was very reluctant to say, yes, Aubameyang is my center forward. In his post-match comments, he basically said he likes it there. He also likes playing on the left, and I'll use him there if need be. Lacazette comes on, two minutes on the pitch, strides into the into the box, steps on the ball, you know, deposits it in the lower right-hand corner of the, of the goal, and it's just, that's sort of quintessential what you want from Lacazette. Dropping into midfield, running into the box, striding onto the ball, and scoring but Obama hanging a hat trick from the center forward position. So this this debate is going to rage on. I think a lot of us feel that picking one of those two to play center forward is the way forward. Arteta won't commit to it. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that based on his comments and, and what we saw today or yesterday. Well, I guess I don't think his comments mean anything in that I don't think he wants to be painted into a corner. Right. Because if he says, yes, Aubameyang's going to be my starter through the center, then uh, he's he has a bit of an issue with Lacazette motivation then because now he said he's my one and you know he just wants a free reign he'll he didn't want to commit himself to whatever because then he plays Aubameyang from the left and Lacazette through the center because you know it hasn't been firing with Aubameyang up front and suddenly the questions are why you said you were going to do this and now you're doing that he's like he doesn't want to have to explain his selections. It's the, I'm going to pick the best selection on the day, depending on the the opponent, depending on form, you know. I, so I I read his comments, and, and even as they are, they don't really say anything. He mentions some names and says, you know, I'm going to do stuff. Um, I hope, because, uh, like, I never had much of an issue with the fact that Aubameyang was coming in from the left. A lot of his better work, even when he's playing through the center, he ends up in the same zones. Uh, our issue is we couldn't, it was the toothpaste problem. We couldn't get enough possession and enough creativity and quality that when we had La- Lacazette through the center, who was supposed to help with this, but not quite enough to make it a worthwhile experiment. We weren't getting Aubameyang on the ball often enough and free enough. And so, you know, I've I've moved away from wanting, from being open to that to, I'm a lot happier with the idea that you got Saka in one, one side of the pitch, uh, Odegaard on the other side, um, supporting the play with Aubameyang through the middle, creating opportunities for him, Smith Rowe, Pepe, whoever, Tierney getting forward and just let's create really good opportunities to get Aubameyang on the end of because the Lacazette thing, while I think he does lots of good work and I think we still underrate him as a as a as a guy who builds play and gets into the box. Aubameyang's our go forward guy. He's he's where the money is. This is Lacazette has chosen to stay for one more season. That's his right. Uh, we've chosen to it looks like use him. And we will, but Aubameyang's our go-forward striker, so he gets priority, and I'm sure Lacazette understands that. And having both of them in the team means we're missing 
a Saka in that spot or a Smith Rowe on the wing create, making stuff happen. So I just think uh, Arteta wants doesn't want to have to answer questions he doesn't want to answer, but it's hopefully going to be predominantly Aubameyang through the middle. Yeah, it's it's interesting how a game like this, the timing of it and what it what it can mean. I mean, you look at the first two games, Brentford and Chelsea, with the players that were missing, and it was a huge opportunity, for example, for someone like Martinelli under very, very difficult circumstances, but did not take that opportunity. And I'm not putting that entirely down to him. A lot of that is the attack not functioning, a lot of that is the opposition, the players are missing, but it didn't and, work and to out. To be fair and to the, him, right? He just got off the airplane from Brazil. No, I, yep. Uh, again, not putting it yeah, on him yeah. at all. I know. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, the season presents opportunities, right? And sometimes those opportunities go well or don't go well through no fault of your own. But you look at this, you know, Saka being dominant in this game, you know, probably now has him being nailed on the start if he wasn't already, which he probably was. And Pepe looking dangerous and Aubameyang scoring a hat trick and Lacazette scoring a goal. And suddenly you look at Martinelli and you say, after two games starting with the first team in tough games, these other guys get to come on and have the time of their life against the U23 West Brom team. By the time Martinelli comes in, the game's decided no one's really playing anymore. And and it, it may now be the case that Martinelli's going to have to wait for his opportunity to, to get back into the team, either through a good substitute appearance or maybe that AFC Wimbledon game. Tim, the the player who I think a lot of people are really curious whether he'll move the needle for us or not is Martin Odegaard. Mm. We got to see his first appearance since uh, signing permanently. He did get an assist. He had that beautiful back heel that Aubameyang intelligently leaves because he was offside for Saka to run on two and score. Is that what it was? Yep. yep. I think that's what it was. It was a beautiful move. But in general, and, I thought he Saka kept Saka the- played the ball to Odegaard first, so it was yes. actually a continuation of the movement. Yeah, and it, was, it, and it was one of two kind of flick back heel goals that Odegaard made because he he did the flick to El Neni who to put El Neni for the Pepe, through ball. Yep, to Pepe who hit the post to Aubameyang put in the net. Yeah, Pe- Pepe with the crossbar challenge and the post challenge in this game, <laughs> really impressive stuff. So I'm I'm curious, Tim. I mean, P- Odegaard is going to be a player much like Ben White, who is just going to be under an unbelievable microscope. You know, <laughs> rescue us, do everything for us, be our everything. In this game, I think plenty of good signs. Obviously, nothing conclusive. But what are your early uh, your early results? Your early conclusions from Odegaard having fun against West Brom? Yeah, and and like a perfect uh, second debut for him, really, to to get the feel of this team and and playing, you know, behind three forwards who he's excuse me who he's going to play with plenty as well against a very obliging high line. So I, I yeah, re- really enthused. I've always been really enthused by this signing just because. I mean, even if his end product numbers, like they need to go up, like there's, you know, there's no two ways about that. I'm sure he knows that. I'm sure Arteta knows that. And I'm sure that's what this is all about. This is kind of, okay, I'm good at the moment, but I can be better than good. And that's, that's what they're, they're, they're really trying to get out of him. But, but for me, just his, his, his presence in like, because we really, we struggle for centrality, right? That's what we we really struggle with. And last night we had it again against an obliging high line, but we, we were actually able to do things through the middle and not just keep going out to the wings all the time and just having that bit of variety. And I, I think you add party into that. Um, and then you've got that kind of, you know, then Tierney is like um, a complementary threat, not the sole threat um, effectively. And, and, and you know, it, it just gives Arsenal other angles as well, and, and Arteta mentioned in the post match, he talked about you know Erdogan going over to that kind of right half space, and it just it just spreads the threat around the pitch a little bit more. So, um, and, you know, when he, we when we critique the team that it doesn't really have a style or what is our style or whatever, I think the importance of this game is given if you like a willing opponent, what is it we're tr- what would we look like with Odegaard? With Saka in the team, what does uh, with the uh, Bamiang? What does Arteta think our attack looks like when yep. you know when we have the ball, when we have the uh, when we can express ourselves? And that's why I think this game is important, not because of the level of the the competition, but because it basically says, "All right, Mikel Arteta, when the toothpaste is all the way up the tube, what what does our attack look like? Building from yep. the like one of the goals is direct from the back, so it has a bit of everything. It has." Tavares instead of Tierney on the left, but pushed all the way up as Tierney would have. I think this game is what 
Arteta's end game is in terms of Arsenal's attacking football. Yeah, yeah, and with with Erdgaard, I I think what what a number ten really has to do is to become like a sponge for the other attackers. And what you have to be is you have to be really cognizant of the strengths of the guys that you play with, and that's um that that's that's the kind of level we're talking about. So what Erdegaard should be doing, and I'm sure he is doing, is going right. Saka's brilliant at running with the ball. He's brilliant at getting turned, getting faced the goal, and then like going at players. So you know, clock that. I know what kind of you know. I know to exchange short passes with him and just let him do that. Um, Abamyang's quite good at running through the middle, finding space. So that's okay. Pepe can do that as well. Like he likes that kind of slide rule pass. Like as as a number ten, what you're looking at is you, you're delivering a service, right? So it's like, what kind of service do the guys around me need? And I thought what was really interesting in Arteta's post match, and uh, get the bingo mugs ready, um, albeit slightly altered, um, because. He, he spoke, so Arteta spoke about, you know, and it's up to the other players to like um, almost get on Erdegaard's wavelength as well. He talked about his intelligence and he said like it's about the other players. Um, they have to recognize his intelligence and like they have to recognize they can move now, right? So Pepe doesn't have to hide um, when it's like 20 minutes into the game and he's barely touched the ball. Keep making that run, keep making that run, keep making that run because Erdegaard will get you at some point. And it was quite interesting to hear Arteta talk about the intelligence of the other players. And, and the reason I, that stuck out for me is because um, talking to Jonas Eideval uh, the other day um, with, with Arsenal women who have signed um, a Japanese playmaker called Mane Wabuchi, who just played brilliantly in both her games so far. And, uh, and he was asked, you know, did you expect her to adapt this quickly? And he just said, when you're intelligent, it's so much easier to adapt to a new team. But the the other key is that the other players are intelligent as well. So when she does clever things, people know she's going to do clever things and they make the runs because they trust her to, to make that pass. And that's that's kind of what need, it needs to be a symbiotic relationship ex- effectively. So Erdegaard has to understand the type of service those attackers want and those attackers have to understand that now we have Erdegaard he will be able to find them. And so they have to keep making those runs. I don't worry about Aubameyang doing that. He's done that his whole career. But, you know, guys like Saka and like Pepe, you know, looking at Erdegaard and going, right, okay, this guy under- like this guy will understand my movements. So I've just got to keep doing them effectively. And, and I think we saw a bit of that last night. Yeah, well said. It, it's a good start to life. It will only get harder, but you'll take a good start <laughs> given what we've been through before. It really just cannot emphasize the extent to which the club needed this lightness. Just, you know, I said this on the Instant Reaction pod, but Clive, like, what this does is it makes all the post-match interviews a little easier, all the build-up to the City game a little easier, the training session's a little more fun, people joking around with each other. The mood just gets lighter, and everyone remembers it's a game, and it stops feeling like such hard work. And that may change on Saturday, but you, you really need something like this. So let, let's get into a little fun speculation and thinking about strategy for, for Saturday now. Smith Rowe and Lakanga didn't play. I, I have to believe both come in, but I still think there's a big question about Saka, Pepe, Smith Rowe, Aubameyang, Lacazette, Odegaard, Martinelli. I think Martinelli's out in the cold there, but where the others fit in, will it wind up being a 4 3 3 at some point with Odegaard and Smith Rowe as eight? So Odegaard is wearing the number eight after all, uh, rather than the 10, which Smith Rowe has taken. So there's that. Arteta joking with him when he signed, take care of that number eight, because of course Arteta was an eight. Very different type of player. I'm, I'm curious if you have a sense of how Arteta will fit those pieces together uh, and, and who might be left out. Now, look, the City game is a unique situation. It may be very different against Norwich after the interlow, but w- what's your initial suspicion? And obviously, look, Arteta's going to wind up proving us all wrong, whatever we say. But if you had to guess, what's your initial suspicion of how those pieces fit together? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But I, what I will say is I think we're going to play double 10 football. And I'm just going to stop you and let you know the noise you made to start that. I'm definitely clipping that and using that as a ringtone. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> double t- we're, we're heading towards double 10 football. In this game, Saka and Odegaard were those two tens. And their movement and the fact that the Pepe and Aubameyang trusted them to do certain things, to keep the ball, make the right decisions, meant that their movement was more proactive. And that's why we looked quick running in behind because we were moving quicker than them. Everything we did was early. 
early and quick and direct. And it's all in those two players' intelligence. And we can do that at different places. Um, I think it's interesting the shape of the team. Uh, there are different ways to attack this. You know, I'd be disappointed if he plays a Bamang off the left um, on Saturday. I don't think we need to. I think we need more ability on the ball. If you're going to play Man City, you need the ability to to break and escape. You know, an escape ability that Odegaard and Saka and Smith Rowe have, I think it's important that they play. I think Pepe may miss out on this game, and that's fine. He doesn't mean he doesn't end the game, you know. So I never worry about starters. I worry about, you know, starters and finishers per se and how we end the game. So Pepe's paid 90. Just move him. Smith Rowe comes in. Of you know, don't care which side, off the left probably. Um, and have people around the ball escaping, making sure that we can stop waves of attack, we can play to people who are secure, and then we can travel, break it up, and then go from there. So I, I know Saturday's going to be tough. I'm not too despondent. If I'm looking ahead, I spoke to you about this the other week. I, I, I do think the team is potentially asking for a different shape, and there are many things you can do on, the, on, on any given day. You know, I don't mind two strikers. I don't mind three at the back. I don't mind a four triple two. I think we're heading towards double ten, so permanently. And I think that's going to be what we're going to be known for. And that connection and that centrality that Tim spoke to, I think it's going to be so interesting when Party comes back because he likes a disguised pass down the middle. So I think we've seen a Odegaard. It was nice to see him back. I was quite surprised how I felt about that, and I, I think. I like him as a player, and I think he looks different already. Like he's made a commitment, and this is my place, this is my career, and I'm going to really lead this lot. And I, he's I do a good like doctor, his, isn't he? Yeah, he's a technical leader, and he he almost he but he beats the drum, doesn't he? You know, yeah. if he wants to have five touches, and he has five touches, and and then the rest of the lads know that thing. one where he back heels for Saka. You can see before Saka passes to him, he's pointing where people should go and. The, to me, that that's what will sort out Pepe on the right wing. He's in the past. I, we've seen him pointing Chambers to go up, move back, Pepe to come across, and I think he'll start organising areas of the pitch for us. Yeah, he can see, he can see the game, and he can see the next passes. He's he's, he's very one of the things I, I use the word already, but I just felt this was a very wise performance. There's a lot of wisdom yeah. on the pitch, and um, and I like that. I hate when we're dumb. You know, I hate when we're done. And I just, you know, creative wisdom and good decisions. And I was so impressed with Saka and Odegaard. So, you know, if you look in the next phase of Arsenal now, the same thing I said last week, can we have a stronger platform? Can we have, at the base of our team, quicker decisions and a little bit more verticality quickly and get it to those wise players who can hold it and run the game from there? The the more it's in that front four, the better it is for us. You know, and I think we've got two or three, maybe four players that can look after that football, get it to them, stop messing about in your own third, get it to them, put teams under pressure. If you lose it, have the ability to win it back. Um, we spoke about the right-back situation. I feel that's the key to this team, um, a technical right-back that can look after it, strong and powerful, that's dominant, and that space shows no vulnerability. If we can add that, I think <clears throat> we get a balanced side and we don't look like a cutback FC from the left side any longer because um, that's, that's that has no future for us in the medium to long term. Yeah, I like the, the, the funny thing to me is just that the, you talk about intelligence. Look, part of a game is having a game plan, but then taking what's available and not trying to take what isn't. West Brom wanted to play a high line, and so we took that. We ran him behind over and over and over again, and it worked. And, you know, I don't I don't know how much of this is going to carry over to the, the next set of games. The good feeling might, whether or not the, you know, the actual way we played is relevant at all, but the players took what was available, and, and it was a good day. Look, I, I want to get into the City game a little more, but before I do, I, I want to make a point. Look, most of us are online, and, you know, as people who are online, the one thing you know is that, like, internet, Security and safety is important, so we're really, I, I think, happy to have um, happy to have a sponsor that addresses this. So let's get into that. Uh, I'm going to read the following question to you: Do you ever feel like you're being followed around the internet? I feel like I'm being followed generally, 
but that's a different issue. Maybe advertisers know a bit too much about you. Our new sponsor, IP Vanish VPN, is here to help you take back your privacy and help become anonymous on the internet. So what is IP Vanish? IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short. VPN is an important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. I will let you know it's also useful for like, if you want to watch videos that are geo-locked, you know, like, there's, there's a video analysis, and it's like, oh, it's not available in your region. Well, this is how it becomes available. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, even things like Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted, what you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, so, you know, if you have, like, secretly, like, another account where you're, like, a Manchester City fan, then you can use a VPN. Nobody knows it's you. That's important because what you're doing on the Internet is no one's business but yours. For listeners of this show, IP Vanish is offering 65%. That's what it says here. So that's what they're going to have to give you. 65% off their annual plan equal to six months free. IP Vanish is super easy to use. You turn it on with the click of a button and it runs seamlessly in the background, helping to protect you while you're browsing the web. And if you do run into problems, no worries. 24-7 support, email, chat, telephone. Go to IP Vanish. That's IP, because I do, Vanish. Clive did a lot last night, so did Tim. IPVanish.com forward slash vision. That's IPVanish.com forward slash vision. Claim your 65% savings. Uh, the first time you sign up with our discount and their current promotion, you can get VPN for 65% off. It's uh, uh, best of the best, rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews, so that's good. Remember, it's IPVanish.com forward slash vision. Get the deal. Start protecting yourself online today. Uh, okay, so Paul... <sighs> You made the point that we kind of had to approach the Chelsea game the way we did in part because it was the first home game of the season. Can't go out and just sit back and be defensive. There was a bit of a a burden on us to play a certain way, or at least that Arteta may have felt that. The City game is the perfect opportunity to not have to do that. I am kind of coming to the idea that we should play a 4-4-2 against City. Two really tight banks of four. Block up everything you can do to just keep them the hell out of our penalty box and set Pepe and Aubameyang up high to, to to press the ball a little bit so they don't have easy access and then take off towards the opposition goal and we just boot the ball along to them every chance we get. Like, I would literally be as direct and counter-attacky as we can be. This is not a game for heroism, in my view, and I know these games have been overly tactical at times, and sometimes we've even gone toe-to-toe with them pretty well in terms of possessing the ball and looking like we have good moments. I just don't think this is the time for that, but maybe that is a defeatist mentality. So are you prepared to be more courageous than I am? Um, yeah, I think so, because the one thing we've seen in these cagey games between Arsenal and City is they're not blowout affairs. Um, and so maybe Arteta goes into this thinking the downside, the risk is not huge. Um, now he could get this wrong. I could get this wrong, but I think he can go into this with something that's basically... Uh, like I don't necessarily think the game last night was an accident in terms of how we set up, but I could well see us playing Saka on the left. And in those moments in which we, we get into their half, when we get into their third, and it's happened in the previous games, we've had spells where we've looked reasonably good and in fact got undone on, uh, once or twice when we looked at our our better selves. I think he may just go and play the way he wants to play because it's City, because in the past it's been okay. You know, we've been frustrated that we didn't do more against them. We've been frustrated that they kind of helped held us at arm's length. But they it wasn't like Liverpool towards the end of last year or Chelsea towards the end of last year or, or Chelsea this game where, you know, we got battered but tried to hang on or maybe did hang on. Um, or we tried to play football like we did against Chelsea and got battered. Um, he may feel uh, we're going to have a much stronger squad too, potentially, um, in, at least in the attacking end. So he may just want to give City another go, go and face his old uh, friend and now rival Pep and play his football away from home and see what we can do uh, without getting crazy, but in a kind of contained um, thing where he can play three at the back, you know, with the Chambers thing like we saw in this, like the West Ham setup, like we saw uh, last night, where he has three at the back when he goes forward, where his his full back on the left gets forward when we get a chance, where Saka peels into the middle. I, I mean, 
in my scenario, we play basically the same attacking lineup we had here, and Smith Rowe maybe mo- loses out till uh, coming on as a sub later on in the game when we need that. And that this was, in a sense, an audition to play our attacking football, which we won't get to do much against City, but we'll get to do some of. And we'll take a fairly similar approach, but we'll spend a lot more time dialed back into our our third, our half. But the game, like when you look at the games against City, I've often thought they were almost decent performances, but they weren't. Uh, it always felt like City had our number, but they were almost. Uh, There's a little of that big a brother holding little yeah. brother at bay while he swings frantically yeah, yeah, with his arms, sure. holding him off. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think he needs like if we, if we were playing Chelsea next weekend or we were playing, uh, you know, uh, if, if we're now scared of Liverpool, which we probably should be, we're playing Liverpool next weekend. Then yeah, four four two. Don't don't embarrass yourself. But against City, I think he just might try and play our football cautiously. Yeah. Well, but yeah, well, and and that look, Tim, that's that's really the issue here, right? Is that I I just want the city game to go away in the least damaging way possible. (laughs) This was a hard run. We got a good lift against West Brom. It restored a bit of good feeling. Let's get through the interlocal. It's interesting because uh, Ramsdale and White, neither of them got called up. So while that may be disappointing for them, given, you know, what's going on with Ben White, more time to train, more time to get integrated, Ramsdale as well. I don't think that's the worst thing. I mean, fewer call-ups, you know, is is usually a a good thing. Obviously, uh, there's a big debate going on right now between FIFA and um, the FA and some other uh, football associations in terms of players being allowed to go to red zone countries, right, uh, mm-hmm. for the international break. So that's that's remains to be seen what will happen if players will be released to go to some South American countries, for example. But in terms of this game and getting through it, I just think discretion is the better part of valor here. I think there's nothing to be gained and everything to be lost in the sense that, okay, look, what's to be gained is you, you beat City. But in my view... Really, the only scenario where that happens is sort of the the Tottenham model of you, you lose the game three to point two on XG, but the point two goes in and the three don't. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you just sit back and you soak it up and you you see if you can hit them. And we have the players to do that with. And I don't know that we have the players to do the opposite with. You know, sort of go to toe toe to toe with them. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being defeatist here, but I, I think this is a game you get through it any way you can. And you you damage yourself as minimally as possible so you can get out of that inner lull and get that sort of reset that some people will be willing to grant. And I know that some people will say that, no, no, that's not how it works. These points count. Where do you fall on that? Are you willing to just do whatever it takes to get through this game with the, with the least exposure possible? Yeah, I think so. And and look, we played City twice in the league last season and they were both fairly uneventful 1-0 defeats. Um. I'm I'm pretty sure we're not going to play Willian as a false nine this time. Um, I think I think that one will <laughs> chalked up to experience and a, an experiment that was never repeated. I mean, like so personally, I've got nothing to say about how you approach this game because I haven't got any idea <laughs> when it comes to City, particularly at home. I, I don't think anyone has really, other than maybe Thomas Tuchel with his, you know, sixty, seventy, hundred million pound players um all over the place other and and probably like Jurgen Klopp but even like Klopp's taken some beatings at the Etihad because they've just kind of gone a little bit hell for leather and just thought well let's just see if the cards fall in our direction I I, I am very much about getting through this yes I, ju- I just can't other than reaching for those like um logical fallacies like the law of averages says we've got to get a result as city at some point. Yeah, that's the gambler's fallacy in this case, <laughs> exactly. right? Like yeah, just yeah. because you've lost all of them doesn't mean you're going to win the next one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, precisely. So um you know, m- maybe we're due um a really fluky win over Man City where we only get 0.2 xg. Um a bit like some of the victories we've had against the likes of Chelsea and Liverpool um in in the last kind of 18 months or so, but yeah, I like for me, it's about. I mean, again, I'm going on Saturday, so I want to enjoy it. Um, you know, 8 a.m. train beers, that will be great. Um, so by the time I get there, again, I'll probably have not much appreciation of what I'm seeing, which is all part of the plan. Um, but the, in, in terms of the actual game, like, I think it, it's to be endured and not just because City are really good and we've never really found a way to lay a glove on them. Um, other than in the FA Cup for some reason, but because 
when City dominate teams, they they're just really boring. It's just a really boring game. Manchester City, Arsenal, it really like particularly at the Etihad, it's like yeah, it's a very very dull game usually, and it doesn't go the way we need or want it to. So expecting more of the same. Yeah, I would take a dull game, I think, in this case, because I think an exciting game <laughs> might be the wrong kind of excitement. So I'll finish with you, Clive. How do we approach it? What is a reasonable expectation from it? There are some Arsenal fans who I will not argue with who say we should never go into a game accepting a loss. We should never go into a game expecting a loss. We should never go into a game expecting to just be rolled over. We should go in trying to win it. Anything less is not okay. I mean, if you want to approach it that way, be my guest. You're talking about champions who have been near the 100-point mark in the last couple of seasons, not last season, but you know, strolled to the to the title in a Champions League final. I mean, I, we're not where they are. So for me, discretion is a better part of valor here, but I, I, I won't argue too ferociously with anyone who doesn't want to see it that way. How about you? How do you see it, and what's the right way for us to get through this game, giving ourselves a chance? Yeah, it's taking 15-minute stages. What what City are developing into is a um, almost a four four two team actually. Um, they're playing almost two false nines, and they are they do what we do but better. They they use the outsides and they create their their overloads. But their second and third man runs are excellent and far more aggressive, uh, accurate, chipping the ball over defence, little diagonals, put it under pressure, create waves of attack by squeezing up. Their centre backs are their playmakers. Their one weakness is they get overexcited and their transition defense is not what it should be. So you need, I said earlier, you need players who can escape, right? So you, when you're under pressure, you should, you should be thinking about winning the ball back. So have your double tens there waiting for it. Can they escape and transition? So Spurs do it quite well. They use Bergwijn and Mora, who are not like 10 tens. They're like sprinty wingers they bring on the inside and they're a threat, they have Son high, and they're a threat. So that threat of speed makes Man City think. They don't quite overload as much as they could. It's very important we have the threat of speed and the ability to escape pressure. And so that's how I would do it. And the key thing is not to go fishing. Hold your line, hold your blocks. Don't get come out of your holes because they will run into it quicker than you can recover. And then just approach it like a, like a football match. It, it is, yeah, I don't like, you know, we may lose, right? But, you know, the way I look at football is we could win and this is how to approach it. I'm not saying we should play a back three in this game because they won't, um, but know where their strengths are. Know who their centre-backs would like to feel comfortable in possession. They will dominate. They'll have 100 touches each. Let's put them under stress. Let's make them defend. Make them run to the sides. Make them transition backwards, right? So that's the key thing with them. The key thing is not to let them feel comfortable having 700 passes because you will get sliced. So that's how I'd approach it. So um, I'm not sure what team we'll pick, but as um, long as we've got those elements that threaten them, as long as we have escapability, as long as we just sometimes less is more in the back line, just stand, don't run, just stand and watch and spin and shuffle from side to side and make sure you've got a lively goalkeeper to come out for those diagonals and, and take them in the air and come out of his line really quickly. And, and see what happens from there on in. Yeah, I look, this is a game that is going to give a lot of people the opportunity to lean into their biases, their confirmation biases, if it goes a certain way. But it's also going to be really interesting if it goes the way we don't expect. I mean, if Arsenal win this game, there's going to be a lot of tweet deleting and, and take deleting after the Chelsea game because this is going to be our first game that we go into with at least some semblance of what looks like a first team this season in terms of the Premier League. Now, I guess Ben White not available. Tierney is available. Does that sort of seem like what it's so. going to be? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Obviously, no Thomas Party. It is kind of crazy to think, look, I'm going to say two contradictory things. Crazy to think how much better we could look after the international break with Party back, White available. It's also absolutely fair to say a club shouldn't need every single one of its first 11 available to look like itself. Totally fair as well. I would suggest that what we went through with Chelsea and Brentford was a bit extreme though. So we'll, I think we'll leave it there. There's going to be an analytics pod for patrons coming up. There's going to be an instant reaction pod for patrons on Saturday. And then we will be giving very, very generously to the Arsenal Foundation uh, as we launch that fundraiser next week. And I hope that you will as well. We'll have all the information about that. We'll have an interview from the Arsenal Foundation about Save the Children, which is a cause that is 
absolutely extraordinary. I can't wait for you to hear about it. And I just hope everyone will give. I'll be going to London in October for the FCA Awards. So we'll do some events there and I'll be at the Palace game. That sort of looks like what's shaping up. More information on that, Anon, because I feel like every event that I announce invariably gets canceled. So I'm just a little gun shy, as you can understand. But I'm just thrilled that we uh, that we got some good feeling back. And I hope you took the chance to to really, really enjoy it. Soak it up. Fun nights like that. If you can't, like I said, if you can't enjoy winning 6-0, like, <laughs> I don't know if football's for you. So I hope you're doing well. I hope you're ha- healthy and happy. And maybe this weekend will be fun. Maybe it won't. But either way, we'll all get through it together, which is what this is all about. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Paul's on Twitter. Pause in my pants. Thanks, pause. Woohoo! Tim's on Twitter. Still better. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. We'll look forward to hearing you sing through good times and bads uh, on Saturday, Tim. In good voice. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, my, my vocal cords, as you can probably hear, are in preseason still. Yeah, but not your drinking. That's what matters. My name's Alex Smith. You can me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Uh, hang in there, everybody. We love you. We will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Manchester City No. 